right, good to see you guys. And uh, we are growing here at Forge, so a little growing pains of getting around, finding your place. Don't hesitate, just, just come in, sin boldly, find your place. Good to have you guys, uh, glad you're with us. Dan Lasich, uh, Oviedo City Church, is rejoicing with me today. Uh, Dan is a historic uh, Steelers fan, but he's really happy that the Rams are going to be f- playing the Patriots, and I think you believe that the, the Rams are going to beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Is that right? Super Bowl? If the Steelers aren't in it, you don't care about it. It doesn't count. It doesn't count. How many of you are pumped that my Los Angeles Rams are in the Super Bowl? How many of you? <laughs> Tim, God bless you. God bless you. I am so glad you're here. Uh, All right, now on to the, now on to lesser matters. Uh, No, no, we're glad that you're here. We're starting a new series in Forge. By the way, let me remind you that Forge is about building great men as God defines greatness. How does God do that? He does that by making us disciples of Jesus Christ. And as he makes us disciples, notice the word is disciples and not dabblers. People who follow Jesus Christ are disciples. We're not dabblers. We don't kind of do the religious thing and say, yeah, it's okay. We're, we are disciples. But the amazing truth is, is that as God builds us as disciples, he turns us into what we really wanted to be all along, and that is real men. It's in our DNA. Uh, we want to be real men, and God develops us in the way that he originally designed us to be. Uh, the men that God's called us to be. I love the story of the, of the guy who was in the grocery store at the express line. And maybe you've been in that express line. And the sign said, six items only. This lady walks right in front of him with a cart full of stuff. And he doesn't say anything because he's trying to be nice. And um, he said he was pleasantly surprised when the cashier looked at the lady's full cart, smiled sweetly, and said, now which of these six items would you like to buy? <laughs> I like that. There's, there's two truths in that. One, women break rules too. Uh, number two, we men break rules. Number three, sometimes we're so nice, we're not afraid, we, we are too afraid to speak the truth. At any rate, we need Jesus, and uh, so uh, uh, as we walk and as we're developed, we we need Jesus or we're never going to become real men, but we also need other guys, and that's why the the theme of this series that we're going to be looking at, Forge Fire Teams, we're going to look at for the the next four weeks, you've got an outline there, and we're going to look at that. Now, having said that, as we go into this new series, I don't want you to forget the dog, right? How many of you have started the daily appointment with God that we talked about for the last two weeks? You started it, you're keeping it, keep going. And go to my Facebook, uh, Pete Allenson Facebook, like me, I'm insecure and I need your like. And, uh, uh, but, but I'll do some dog tactic updates to try to encourage us to keep in this doing our dog. Bishop, how many, uh, you sent me a text, I haven't had a chance to finally read that. Does it take 21 days to set a new habit? It's a myth. It doesn't take 21 days. How long does it take to set a new habit? There's no length of time to set a new habit. You just got to be committed to it. If you're a Steeler fan, I don't know if you can ever start a new uh, habit or not. Uh, What I want to (laughs) do, love you, Dan. You know, there's power in the pulpit, right, Dan? So you can beat up your people on Sunday, and I'll beat you up on Tuesday. Um, Man Essentials. You beat me up on Sundays, yeah. (laughs) I don't go to your church because he throws me under the bus, yeah. Um, All right, I want to do, as you see on your outline, as we go into this new series, I want to do some review real quick. I want to give you some essentials. What we talk about around here at Forge a lot are the two key areas of identity and purpose. Identity, core identity, and core roles. And this is so important because as we think about moving ahead, I'm going to add a third plank today in this series. But i got to do a quick review for some of you who are new to Forge because we talk about identity as being the core thing. And, and so you guys have been around for a long time. What is a man's core identity? What do we say? 
son. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, John says, whoever receives him, to them he gave the right to become sons of God, children of God. And so when a man accepts Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that's his core identity. That never changes in all time or eternity, no matter what your circumstances. Uh, and, And so what we're often doing every day is getting up, going out to try to find our identity. But in the gospel, God says, no, your identity as is a deeply beloved, redeemed son of the Most High God. That's your core identity. You can't earn that. Identity is bestowed by God. It's it's never earned. You can't earn an identity. It's just impossible. All right, so having then said that we have a core identity, then the New Testament goes on to tell us what a man's core roles are. And around here at Forge, we talk about a man's core roles, which are, first of all, we are a leader. Secondly, we are a worker provider. Thirdly, we are a, a warrior ambassador. So those are core roles. And all, all of discipleship fits into those categories. And by the way, that is purpose. Purpose. Uh, our core roles are our purpose. And a man, a man cannot live without an identity and purpose, and the, the purposes of, of life are given to us by God. I want to say a couple of things about purpose. I believe that a man with a who and a why can endure any what. A man with a who and a why can endure any what. If, if you know who you are in Christ and what you're supposed to be doing on the planet, you can endure just about anything. I mean, you can go through hell if you know you're not going to be there forever. And the reality is, is, is that identity and purpose are crucial. Would you all agree with me on that? Anybody fight? Yeah, everybody agrees with me on that. I love the, there was a guy who was a duck hunter, a committed duck hunter. He had all these dogs uh, that got, went out and got the, got the ducks, you know, and some of you duck hunters have had duck dogs. You know what I'm talking about. But this, this guy, had, he lived on a farm, and he had all these dogs duck dogs that just look they were lazy most of the year until when duck season duck season they were up they were going why because they were about doing what they were designed to do that's true for us as well Uh, Thomas Carlyle said the man without a purpose is like a ship without a rudder a waif a nothing a no man I agree with that now I'm not going to be PC here I'm going to say this Our world constantly tells you, get a purpose, find a purpose. You know, all of these motivational speakers, basically, uh, that we see around us are humanistic uh, motivational speakers. They don't believe that you were created. They believe you are a, a chance organism in the universe, right? Tony Robbins, Oprah, all these motivational speakers, they say, you gotta have a purpose, right? But what they basically are saying it, when you cut behind the scenes is you weren't created, so you got to create your own purpose in life and identity. And so what they're really saying is something like this. You're a chance object in the universe. You're a cosmic mistake. You really shouldn't be here, but you are. So come up with an identity. Think of the Eastern mysticism says you're a god, so call yourself a god. Knock yourself out. If you want to call yourself a god, do you want to say you're really important, that's great. And then come up with your own identity. Come up with your own identity and your purpose. And, and what the Christian says to that is that's, that's ridiculous. Because that's above our pay grade to tell who we are and what we're, why we're here. The Christian says God defines that, who I am and why I'm here. And it's so important. Probably the best thing that we can say about why we're here is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Uh, and, uh, and so... Identity and purpose are absolutely crucial. By the way, I'll do another promotion here. The dog, the daily appointment with God. That's why we started out the first two weeks of the year with the daily appointment with God. What fuels your identity and your purpose every day? What keeps you and me focused on who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing? My daily appointment with my father, who reminds me, Alwinson, you're not going out there to try and find your identity. You're my son because of Jesus. Now go out and live it uh, and fulfill your core roles. Okay, all right, we got it? All right, now, here we go. Let's move ahead. 
What is the third major plank that is needed for a man to continue to grow into greatness and as God defines greatness? What is the third major plank or the third major leg on the stool? Identity, purpose, brotherhood. We said that with such conviction. Um, brotherhood. Uh, and and so that's why we're talking about it because I think we have this idea about how important brotherhood is, having brothers in Christ, but I don't think we understand it completely. And, and so that's why we're going to talk about it. Now, I, I got I to do a little confession here. This was the idea of brotherhood and, um, and having some buddies and having some guys to help me grow a fire team. I'll talk about that. That was not really in my DNA growing up. Uh, and, and even as a young Christian and as a younger pastor, and I've been a pastor since the time of the Apostle Paul, um, but even as a pastor, this was not, a, the, bro, the idea of brotherhood was not a big deal. And I, I wrote down why. Number one, this was not modeled in my home. The idea that a man had friends was not modeled in my home. My dad didn't have any friends. He had a billion friends acquaintances. He knew a lot of people, but he had no friends. I, I can't look back. Well, I can. He had one that I could think of, uh, but we didn't spend much time with him, and he didn't spend much time with his friend. My dad was a loner and died alone. This, so brotherhood was not a big deal. Shame and unworthiness is the second reason why I didn't really develop brotherhood early in life. I, because I grew up in a home where there was a lot of shame doled out, and some of you know what I'm talking about. You were in those kinds of environments. I didn't feel worthy, so wh why am I going to build friendships with other people? If you don't feel worthy, who's going to want to spend time with me? Who's going to want to be my friend? Uh, shame and unwor uh, unworthiness. Also, there, there's this idea of the shame to achievement syndrome. And the shame to achievement syndrome is, I don't feel worthy, so if I'm going to feel worthy, what do I have to do? I have to achieve. So, you know, why spend time building friends when you got to work or when you got to achieve? Because that's the only way you'll have an identity or feel good about yourself. And so I didn't develop a, a lot of friendships uh, early in life because I was trying to achieve. The fourth reason was temperamental. Go back, what was the name of the series? Does anybody remember our series, the end of last year, on temperament? We called it? You could hear a nasal drip in this room right now. I love it. Go back to ForgeBibleStudy.com. Go, Knowing Yourself is the name of the series. We talked about temperament. And so we, oh, yeah, that's what it was. Um, um, knowing Yourself. Temperamentally. I'm an extrovert on both levels, sanguine choleric. We talked about all the time. And a lot of times the sanguine choleric doesn't feel like he needs. And we're my, yeah, I just don't need friendship. Well, I do. I want them. But, yeah, I'm a mile wide and an inch deep. How you doing? Good. And, but we don't feel like we really need friends sometimes. We want friends, but we don't feel like we need them. And then the fifth reason why I really didn't develop this brotherhood thing is that the dominant model of manhood as I was growing up was who was the Western star who I cut my teeth on as a John Wayne, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Rugged individualism, this whole idea. I was raised uh, on this idea in the movies that a man was, a real man was a guy who stood alone, right? The Lone Ranger. Now, he had Tonto, but he was still the Lone Ranger. Here, the, many of you have heard of the, um, of the poem Invictus. How many of you heard of the poem Invictus? Okay, when I, when I say it, you'll know what I'm talking about. I, ne I never read this as a kid, but this was the spirit that ruled my young life and, and the, the life of a lot of guys my age. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever God's, I thank whatever God's may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstances, I have not winced or cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the 
captain of my soul. Now, listen, I, I don't like poetry. I figure if you have something to say, say it. Don't be artistic about it. And, and my other philosophy about poetry is don't follow poets. They are weird, most of them. Now, if you're a poet, uh, come talk to me and I'll repent. But the reality is, it, but that was the spirit. That was the spirit of growing up. I'm the captain. All of this, I, I got this. I got this. How you doing? You know, I've said it a million times. How you doing? I'm fine. How are you? And so, so a couple of questions for you. As you think about this, how do you feel about the role of other people in your life? Number one question, do you have a group, even a small group of guys, that you would call friends, that you like to do things with, or are you a loner? Number two, do you have a group, even a small group, that if you got into trouble, you could call? I mean, who, you know, we used to have a saying around our church, who could you call at 2 a.m.? And I used to always respond, don't call me at 2 a.m. <laughs> but, but who could I call at 2 a.m. if I had to talk, if life fell apart, if it was really bad, who could you call? Do you have anybody like that? Number three, do you have a team, uh, a, a core team of brothers, people you call brothers, who, who love you, that actually like you, <laughs> that, you know. I have, I have all kinds of Christians that love me. They tell me, I love you, brother, you know, but I, I don't like you. Um, it's, it's scary when your congregation says that to you. We love you people. We don't like you much. <laughs> but if you've, if you've not really focused on building a core team of brothers, why not? What's kept you from that? Is your story similar to mine? Uh, when you think about it more deeply, has any guy really helped you grow? Um, how could growing men help you in this phase of your life? Okay, those questions all are around this, uh, this series that we're going to look at together. And we talked about core identity. We talked about core roles and purpose. Now we want to talk about a core team of brothers to help us move ahead. So today in this first part, why in the world do this? On your outline, why build a fire team? I'm going to give you three reasons two of which I'm going to explain, then you can talk about them around your table, and next week we'll get the third reason. But the first reason why we need to build a fire team is because of life's battle intensity and complexity. Uh, life is a battle, isn't it? It really is. It's not easy. It's a spiritual warfare, and the battle that we're in is intense, and it's very complex. Ephesians, ah, uh, I wrote that up there wrong. Sorry about that, guys. It's not Ephesians 2. It's Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 uh, is the text that you could look at and memorize. Uh, the Apostle Paul starts out saying some powerful things. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of, of who? Of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's, a, it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There is God's kingdom, and there is a counterfeit kingdom. And that kingdom we can't see, but that kingdom's very organized. Um, for our struggle is not against... Uh, flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. That's the hierarchy. Against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to what? Stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so what we see here from Paul, and he's not kidding. And Peter says the same thing, 1 Peter 5, 5. Um, 
Humble yourself there. Yeah, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I said this Sunday when I was preaching. I said, Satan hates your guts. And I've been trying to think about how, how to articulate that well. I don't know. All I can say is he hates your guts more than you know. And he hates your guts because he hates God. He hates, he hate, yeah, there's, there's a line. That, gosh, I don't know. I could say it, I suppose. Satan hates you as much as Democrats hate Trump. That's the, that's the best way I can. <laughs> I'm sorry, they do. And, and you know, I don't know. The battle rages around us, guys. And either way you look at that, you know, the, the, it's so intense. It's so complex. And just when we think we've figured our lives out, we realize we don't. The battle is intense and complex. And when you think, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm kind of skating right now. Something's brewing. You know, it just is. That's the way it is. And we need brothers to help us fight against the intense conflicts with our addictions. And in this room are men with addictions. You know it. I know it. Addictions come in pairs with spares. It could be food. It could be sex. It could be uh, uh, working out. It could be anything. Our marital problems, our losses, uh, our mistakes, our trials, our financial issues Guys, we need brothers to help fight with us, not fight against us. We got plenty of guys fighting against us. I need guys fighting for me. I need guys that are saying, I stand with you. And, and, I, and I can say back, I'm standing with you. Now, I, I love you guys. I, this is a highlight of my week. I want you to know. I, I, I love you guys. But I can't stand with all of you at the same time. Your pastors can't stand with all of you. You've got to have a couple of people that stand with you. Um, the, the second reason why we, we need to have a, a, a core team, a fire team, and I'll explain that in just a minute, is the high price of isolation. My friend Gary Yagel, who is also a, a minister in the PCA, wrote a little booklet called Got Your Back, and he lists six reasons why we need guys that have our back. Here they are. You ready? I'm going to do them real quick. And you, there will be a test on this You'll, afterwards. Uh, no, no, no test. Here it is. The first reason is we need guys that are fighting for us and that have got our back because we, we become undisciplined. We start out good, don't we? We start out really good in setting goals for the new year. Now, what's today? January 22nd. Some of you have set goals. Some of you didn't raise your hand on the dog because you have already failed a couple of days. Well, me too. It's not 100%. God won't love you more if you do the dog. I will love you more if you do the dog. I'm just kidding. But listen, we get undisciplined easy, don't we? Pat Morley wrote this. He said, some men have spectacular failures where in a moment of passion, listen to this, we're in a moment of passion, they abruptly burst into flames, crash, and burn. But the more common way men get into trouble evolves from hundreds of tiny decisions, decisions which go undetected, that slowly, like the water tapping on a rock, wear down a man's character. Not blatantly or precipitously, but subtly over time. We get caught in a web of cutting corners and compromise, self-deceit, and wrong thinking, which goes unchallenged by anybody in our lives. Isn't that true? I've seen spectacular failures, trust me. But more, I've seen those, what he just said, the getting undisciplined, the making of small, bad decisions that add up. And then, boom, your wife leaves. You lost your job. You're in over your head with an addiction. We get undisciplined, and I need brothers who will help keep me disciplined. Number two, we become tired. The high cost of isolation. We, by the way, we men live in silos pretty well, don't we? We silo our individual life, our thought life, our work life, our, our play life, whatever. And so when somebody says, how are you doing? We say, good, in my work life. I'm doing really good. I can smile about my work life, you know. And then, but the rest of it, nah, you know. 
we become tired. Proverbs 27, 17 um, says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. But we get tired in life. Uh, and, and we get tired when we're doing life alone. A businessman wrote this, I'm tired, blessed, but alone. In one year, we've seen a tenfold increase in business, and that's exciting. But I'm tired because I feel alone. Yes, I have a wife who is very supportive, but there are no men supporting me. When I read in Exodus 17 of Moses being lifted up by other men, I watch a team of men fight the Amalekites, the hated enemies of the Israelites. Moses gets tired, yet Aaron and her and his two friends hold him up. God, I need some Aaron's and hers in my life to join me. See, that's interesting. We think that if we just have the right wife, we'll make it through. No, we need brothers. We need brothers. Why? Because brothers bring some muscle to the game. They fight differently than our wives do. I need brothers because I get tired. Number three, uh, our blind spots cause us great damage. <laughs> Uh, the pr high price of isolation is that we develop blind spots. We have blind spots. Anybody who does not have a blind spot, raise your hand. It's kind of a trick question there. Because when you have one, you don't know. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Blind spots cause us damage. We lose sight of our priorities, number four. Number five, we become more susceptible to secret sins. Secret sins. If I don't have guys fighting for me, see, if I have brothers who know what I'm doing, can they see if I have secret sins? They're more likely to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, they are. And number six, we become comfortable with mediocrity. Ah, yeah, I've quoted John Mason. Mediocrity is a region bounded on the north by compromise, on the south by indecision, on the, on the east by past thinking, on the west by a lack of vision. Mediocrity. Uh, I, the high price of isolation leads to all of those things. So we need a core team. And so what I want to encourage us to do is to build a, is to build a fire team. I want each of you, so this is individual. You say, well, what do we got around the table? A fire, let me, let me just explain this a little bit. I've never been in the military. I wish I had been in the military. Uh, but uh, the Marines, the Army, uh, they have different uh, uh, discussions or uh, policy on this, on what a fire team actually is. But depending, you can look it up. You can Google it, and I encourage you to Google it. A fire team is basically two to four guys that fight together for each other to stay on mission. And that's why I like it, because they're fighting together for the mission, but they're fighting for each other. That's what I like about a fire team concept. Uh, I thought about uh, one guy who called these things fight clubs, and I sort of like that, but it almost sounds like you're dabbling in it. Hey, let's go have a fight, you know, like Pat, uh, uh, Brad Pitt in the movie Fight Club. Okay, all right. Uh, but I like fire team, because a fire team says there's a bigger mission out there. Extending the kingdom of God. And I'm on mission. And I got, I got two to four guys that are fighting with me. They're protecting me while helping me carry out the mission. I'm fighting for them while helping them carry out for a mission that's bigger than them. And that's why I love this idea of a fire team. And uh, uh, almost every former military guy says, what, what, what do they say? What do they miss the most about being in the military? The camaraderie. What do many of us who've never been in the military, what have we never really experienced much with other men? Camaraderie. If you've been on a sports team, you had it. I was in a Boy Scout organization that was, uh, I went through an extensive initiation in the backcountry when I was uh, 15, and, and they kicked our, it was a military type of uh, initiation. It's, it was hazing. They don't do it anymore. But all of us that went through it and made it out, we go, man, we made it. We're still alive. It was awesome. It was, ended up being my rite of passage. And with those guys, I can see them. I texted one of them yesterday. I've known them since fifth grade. Texted them yesterday. We're still brothers. We need to develop these kinds of situations. Uh, I want to keep this simple. So what is discipleship? Discipleship, Jesus says in Matthew 10, is 
becoming like your master. That's what it is. It's receiving your master as Savior and Lord. But as Jesus, as Jesus says, Jesus spoke to them, all authority has been given to me. No, that's the Great Commission. In Matthew 10, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a slave above his master. It is enough that the disciple become like his teacher and the slave like his master. Where are we going, guys? We want to become great as God defines greatness is becoming like Jesus. And I can do it only if my identity is set in Jesus, if I'm pursuing the purpose of my life, the core roles of leadership, working the right way, fighting for the right things. I can't do it without brothers. The body of Christ, the community of God's people. I need brothers. So my challenge is to not only have a good talk around the table, and develop a cohesiveness around your tables. But from this time, through the rest of the week, beginning to develop at least two other guys, that you get on your fight, your fire team, who fight for you and with you. We'll talk more about it next week, but right now I want you to talk about that around your table. Got some questions for you to look at, and I'll get you out of here on time. All right. That right there, gentlemen, is one reason why we need fire teams. Because the time is up, we got to scatter. Uh, but as we scatter, we need brothers that are still fighting with us and for us. And uh, so there it is. Hope you had a good conversation around your table. Cleaned up any heresy I may have committed. And... Uh, and got going in the right direction. couple things. Just what do we do here? What do we do? We enter the forge. Uh, we, we, get, we get some light and some heat. We get hammered around the table thinking and they're act, And then we go out there into the world, hopefully shaped some, bit by bit. And if you come in here hammered in another way, then we need to talk. Uh, that's a, an addiction that we should probably talk about. But what do we do in a forge? We encourage you to invite a friend. Promote ForgeBibleStudy.com. Um, and then we're going to be started. See, I'll add it in there. Start a fire team. Become a partner. We need, we need 50 guys given 50, 25 to 50 bucks a month. Keeps us in the game. And then friends on top of that. We'll be talking about that. We do have a city to win. We're not in it just for ourselves. Thank you for your partnership. You guys are already partners. Thank you for keeping us so we can meet, meet here on a weekly basis. All right. Wrapping it up. Next week, we're going to continue uh, in this series, we're going to talk about um, the six, uh, six interesting or good teams from the Old Testament. And we're going to end with Moses. You ever think there are teams in the Old Testament? Yeah, there are. There's the, first, the first five were marginal to some extent, but we're going to look at Moses and his team and see how teams is pervasive in the Old Testament, how important it is. Someone has said, you know, Ask the question, why is it that politicians work so hard to get, to get reelected? And uh, uh, politicians make fun of pastors, so pastors can make fun of politicians, I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, the reason, he said, the reason why politicians try so hard to get reelected is that, is that they would just have to hate to live to try to make a living under the laws that they passed while they were in office. Um, we all break the rules. And uh, as we saw at the beginning of our time, but also, if we could, if we could, we would bend the rules or make the rules to make life work for us. Uh, the politician is a little bit in all of us, and, um, uh, and, yet, and yet Jesus redeemed us to be men as he defines men, great as he defines it, excellent as he defines excellent, right, John? And... and um, and, and so we're not going to do it the way the world does it. We're going to go His way. That's why we meet together. Um, that's why we study His Word. But I need brothers. You need brothers. And we've got to hang together. Or as Benjamin Franklin said in those early days, we must hang together or surely we will hang separately. Um, and I, I would rather, if I'm going to die, I'd rather die with brothers. For 
the right cause. Not all my own, off in the weeds. Uh, so we're building here. Hey, uh, we're going to have an East Coast table, East Coast Believers table. Dan, you're going to have to, you know, you're, you're losing a good guy starting another table. <laughs> Pray for your pastors uh, and pastors, your pastors and pastors of other churches because they come up with comments like this. No, seriously, we're pro-local church. We're pro-pastor. I love you, Dan. Pray for our pastors. Pray for our churches. Um, and remember, they need, they need solid men with them. Now, I'm going to end with another poem uh, that you all have heard about. This came out uh, in uh, the 1600s. John Donne, an Englishman, in contrast to that other poem, Invictus, said one that is so famous that all of you will know it, and it was the inspiration between, behind Ernest Hemingway's book, For Whom the Bell Tolls. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Gentlemen, nowhere is that more true than in the body of Christ. We are connected in Jesus, and he has determined that we grow in community with brothers and sisters, but we grow with, bro we grow with brothers that will fight for us, not against us. You take it to heart. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the mighty army that has been and still is the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the church uh, invincible, which is in heaven. We thank you for the church militant, which is on the planet right now. And as we, we, we recognize who we are as your beloved sons through faith in Christ, as we pursue our purpose today, I pray that you would build in us that desire for brothers, even those of us who tend to be loners. I pray that, Lord God, you would build us as men. And then, and then at the end of our lives, we can look back and see that you did far more through us and through our brothers than we ever thought possible. So be with my friends, be with my brothers. Give us a great day as we move out there into your world. We pray these things in your strong name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Have a good week, guys. We will see you soon. 